So we've been looking at two presentations, one on IoT, one on AI. I would ask Ihab, what do you think AI can do for IoT? What are, the, what are your solutions specifically, or in terms of AI in, 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 in fraud prevention, what can it do to support IoT, if that's not an obvious question? That's uh, not only obvious, but a difficult one, I think. Okay. Um, so I think when, when IoT started, they were actually scattered everywhere. And even from the network operator perspective, they couldn't identify IoT devices, although they have different way of operating, they have different needs and different interaction with the network. So an AI ML could actually be helpful in identifying and segmenting those devices in order to provide some flexibility in terms of offering and in terms of even commercial proposals that should support something like that. So this is just one of the use cases that AI can actually be used at the IoT domain. Right. And, and, and Lars, do you agree with that opinion? Is, is, is beyond, I mean, is that something you agree on in terms of how we could po potentially use AI or machine learning to improve IoT services? Yeah, if we're talking about sort of different types of improvements, because the one thing is, of course, to improve the understanding of the data that is collected by the IoT devices. That, that's one thing, and that will be, again, the customers uh, that will benefit from that. And another thing is also probably use AI on the devices to uh, identify the best network. There's some logic already, but it could probably yeah. be improved uh, so that also selection of services and things like that. So, so there are probably also, yes, possibilities for applications there. Fantastic. Okay, difficult question over with. Now to the audience. What questions do we have for our illustrious guests? All having had your lunch, I know you're probably feeling a bit tired. Maybe you had your coffee as well, but please. And kind of so. Hello? Ah, it's yeah, working. There we go. So it's not actually a question, but um, uh, a reply. Lars was asking uh, what's the difference between having. Uh, uh, 30 SIM cards in a network one day, for one day and uh, the same SIM card for 30 days. The difference is uh, the perceived uh, threat of uh, the um, SIM card which stays around for 30 days. Um, management sees that scenario as a threat to their domestic business while 30 different SIM cards moving around are not perceived the same way. And uh, I use the word perceived uh, on purpose um, because it's uh, arguable whether it's um, um, a threat or not. But um, as, um, as manager for roaming, uh, uh, we have to um, come up uh, with uh, ways to make uh, management, upper management, uh, and ultimately shareholders comfortable about permanent roaming. And that, uh, I think, uh, we need to work together in order to do that. Because the, the roaming manager, the IoT negotiator, are mere agents of uh, um, the upper management and the shareholders for that concern. Sorry. It was linked to uh, the network utilization, which is what I think we should pay for. And I appreciate that there can be different uh, perception of what is the, diff the market for IoT. If there's a domestic market, or it's all an international market. And I think that what we've seen in terms of the development of IoT services, there is less and less argumentation why there is a domestic market. And this is due to the fact that it's, uh, again, uh, not companies going out buying s local SIM cards. It's companies, uh, for example, we could take a, a municipality that, that wants to have controlled the lightning of the city, the lights in the city. They will not go out and put a SIM card in every light pole. They will buy a solution 
from a company that already have integrated this and have probably a very advanced uh, solution for controlling the light uh, of the streets. So, so I think that it's more and more difficult to find real domestic access solutions or requirements in IoT. And that's why probably also need to have this discussion internally in the different companies. Of course, it's obvious that we have it in our company, uh, but it also uh, something that is needed for the industry to appreciate uh, the possibilities in IoT uh, and, and being a little bit more open for this discussion than protective. And, and, and Kanasau, your specific, um, the specific concern of the management is, of, of a sim being in there for 30 days is, is what? Is, is security? Is, is, is that it's not using enough data to be monetized or? Uh, I think mostly uh, uh, the concern is whether through this roaming uh, use case, um, the domestic business is being eroded. But uh, I do, I fully understand uh, what Lars was uh, explaining. The, the, um, we are looking at a business that would not be, would not be available locally. But um, sometimes it, it's, it is hard to demonstrate that, especially when um, they, they see uh, use cases um, uh, on their own customers. They yeah. have a, a company which is their customer for mobile, and oh. certain, suddenly they realize that that comp company is using um, a service um, w which is using our own roaming service. Um, but um, um, I'm not arguing for the case that it is a, a threat. Mm. Uh, on purpose, I said perceived. Okay. Um, but um, um, it's um, a common challenge for all of us to bring that comfort yes. uh, up to the, the decision-making chain. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for that. Roberto, I think you're going to get a microphone shortly. I just wanted to add something because uh, the fear is not only coming from the, the top management of the, uh, the operators, but in some countries. Uh, there's also the government having an open eye on that and thinking, okay, dear Encarnação, uh, your local subscriber, I tax you. But the roamer, if it's unknown, I cannot tax. So uh, Brazil, I know that the uh, government is looking at taxing mm. the local operators for the permanent roamers because they say they are using the Brazilian network anyways, and I want also my piece in that cake, you know? Oh, that's very, correct. Very interesting. That there are countries where you are not allowed to have permanent roaming. And there you lo use local SIM cards with localization. And, and I think most of the uh, operators that are providing uh, IoT services, they have this capability. They have SIM cards where there is a slot for a uh, uh, eSIM uh, MC that is local. I mean, Brazil is one example. Uh, Saudi Arabia is another example. And there's something in between in UAE where the provider of the service has to have this approved by the authorities. Uh, also, I think uh, there's China and Turkey as examples. So, so yes, this exists, but it's not a commercial discussion between two operators. It's actually uh, something that the authorities have, uh, have decided. Yeah, sure. Uh, but it, it becomes part of the, uh, the discussion when the government is charging one of the two parts, you know. So this will enter the game the same way. And what Brazil is doing, uh, instead of uh, opposing to the permanent roamers, that was the initial uh, position. So we oppose, permanent roam is not allowed. What they are doing now is, okay, dear operators, you tell me how many permanent roamers you have on your network, and I charge you. If you don't tell me, I tell you how many they are, and I will charge you. <laughs> 
Yeah, and, and I think the best solution is that the operator tells because they are the only one who can identify it. Uh, so so uh, this, this will be the way forward. And it's something I think is starting to increase. Uh, more and more countries are getting behind this, this concept. So it's, yeah, we, start, we have to work some work to do on this, I think. Any more questions from the audience? Wow, okay. Four, I see four. So, should we go from the back forwards? <laughs> Stuart, do you want to? And then you can hand the microphone. <laughs> so, uh, just a quick question about IoT roaming. Um, obviously, 2G, 3G, 4G is working brilliantly. It's riding on top of you know, retail, um, as we discussed. But there's a huge gap for CAT-M and NB uh, in terms of roaming. Um, what do you think we can do to accelerate that? Because it's beginning to hurt the industry. Customer driven. If the customers are asking for it, then, then it will be the driver. That's one thing. Another thing is also that narrowband IoT is something that can be identified when the customer logs on a device, logs onto uh, narrowband IoT, uh, whereas you can open for LTEM, but it's not possible for the home network to actually identify if the customer has got the LTEM. So that's probably also something we need to work with. Uh, and, and again, it's also very much driven by the devices that the customers have. We have still a huge number of legacy 2G, 3G devices. The newer ones will, of course, be LTM or narrowband, depending on the applications. The expectations on roaming when it comes to narrowband is not so high because it's, uh, it might be a different type of applications you will see, but it uh, needs to be shown. We are not seeing that many uh, narrowband IoT devices in our networks yet. Uh, Lars, I have a sub-question on that. Do you think that there is enough promotion of those, um, those mobile IoT solutions um, in the marketplace in order to, for, let's say, operators to get a bigger market share of IoT? When, when I think of promotion, then I think of promotion towards the uh, customers. Yeah, and, and I have seen all the uh, operators that are providing IoT. They have white papers on the difference between the different technologies okay. and things like that. So it, it, something has also to do with the cost of the uh, devices that are supporting the different uh, access technologies. Right. And I think that's probably something that needs to uh, move. But I think it's, it's, it's important that when we're talking about this, uh, a lot of people are talking about 5G standalone with slicing. But actually... LTEM and narrowband IoT is a kind of a slice on 4G. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think we uh, are very clear on that when we have these discussions. Mm -hmm. So Charles, I think you had a question. So um, when we talk about IoT, we're talking about enterprise customers uh, uh, for, yeah, for the businesses. So how to solve the, the SLAs in roaming? We, we cannot have IoT devices and all of a sudden it doesn't work and we're all depending on the VPM and willingness to solve the issue. Yes, it is a, a challenge that we have this best effort. And, and as we're moving into uh, applications, uh, for example, in the health care area where it's, it's very much depending on having the connectivity uh, all the time, this will have to increase from being just best effort um, of course, the most of the, uh, the operators, again, providing this, they have their own uh, network operation center that are overlooking all the, uh, the roaming. Um, but it's not always that you have the reaction from or uh, taking care from the roaming partner. So, so the, it is a challenge. And, and uh, it's good that there is an increased work on uh, quality and, uh, in, within GSMA. But I still think it's, it's something that, unfortunately, will take some time uh, before we have uh, real SLAs uh, in, uh, in roaming. Matthew, I think. Oh, sorry, Vijay, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, just a comment on uh, when you said that how AI and machine learning can help IoT industry. I was saying, I was thinking because I'm now kind of involved with this analysis when it comes to IoT devices in one of the thing where AI and machine learning can help is to, to analyze the, the device patterns, the usage patterns, 
how it is distributed on the day basis and help network planning, capacity planning to improve the quality of service for those devices. So, yeah. And then uh, second thing is I really like the presentation for fraud management because I have been involved with fraud management earlier and I can really feel the pain uh, where fraud management, fraud managers are going through. But I feel that the solutions what we have in the industry currently are more reactive. Uh, whatever solutions you are also presenting for AI and machine learning are kind of more reactive approach. To what extent can we make it proactive? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, that's a very good question, and I, and I agree with you. I think that um, we have been trying to address the problems before they happen. But as we were discussing, there were some initiatives, even sponsored by the GS GSMA, to change the architecture and to add some components to the cool flow that will actually make it more proactive. Let's talk about interconnect, for example. So up until today, everybody in the network of delivering the call from A number to B number has full access to the call. He can change the A number, he can change the B number, and this is the source of the problem where actually all CLI refiling, bypass, anything that is happening for interconnect is due to this simple fact. But let's take a look at the industry. What have we done to address the root cause of the problem? Up until today, it is just like some discrete efforts here and there. Somebody is working on AB handshake while others are working on stair shaking while GSMA is trying to do seismic and they stop. There is no coherent, focused efforts to address the root cause of the problem that will actually make it just disappear. So up until we get this collaboration in the industry, we need just to work on our tools in order to minimize the impact of the fraud, trying to get the best of everything between legacy controls up to AIML-driven controls, uh, being smarter than our fraudsters in order to beat the fraud, and they try to match it to that, to that race. But unfortunately, the root cause of many of the problems is the architecture. It's, it is the nature how the telecom operators were designed to connect and interconnect with each other. It's almost like you need some kind of alliance to oversee the whole, the whole piece, if, in case there isn't that entity there, right? Because it's just the fraudsters are having a, a well of a time. They are, and you know, they are making, they're living out of it. We're trying to fight it because we want to protect our shareholder, stakeholder uh, interest, but they are making their living. So definitely they will do whatever they can do in order to, to keep living in that and getting money out of it. So if we don't address the root cause, we will still be in this cat and mouse game, trying to over, just achieve what they are doing, trying to oversmart them and block them. Hi. AJ. I will. Yeah. Going back to the IoT discussion now, sorry. Not fraud. That's okay. So there were, there were two or three concepts we discussed. One is about permanent roaming. And I think it, it, it comes in from history where the fear of the operators was, will a customer buy a cheaper data package from, let's say, France and go to Belgium and live there permanently and do that. But that's kind of, you know, that, that hangover has stuck with regards to IoT. There's definitely a case for permanent roaming on IoT. Operators are looking at now charging IoT differently, and I've come to your point about having one charge, because today, as BICs, we offer solutions to our customers, but with operators changing their charging models, from you know per MB charging to a per MZ charging, and different arbitrary charges, depending on what they want to do, without supporting NB IoT and LTM. And the reason, uh, and I'm going to give some, you know, uh, what I've understood is that NBIOT, LTM, the device cost, the module costs about 5 euros to build a module. When you add 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, the module cost goes, to, goes up 10 times to 40 euros. So when, when an enterprise has built their whole business case on a module of 4 euros, you suddenly start charging 10, 15 cents per MZ per month, the whole business case goes out the window. So what is the industry doing in terms of the collaborative work to be able to no, uh, progress this. At the moment, operators are acting like, I mean, not acting like, but their, their policies are not helping grow this industry. It's, it's going to be a 4 billion uh, devices in a few years from now. And, and at the moment, we don't see all of them roaming. So I'm trying to figure out what, is, what can we do as an industry to make this happen, make it progress further. Are there better conversations to be had? Are there 
and you've been at the forefront of it for the last many years, I understand. So, what are the challenges you face and what do you think we should do to, and I blow out the park, just do it is your motto, but anything else apart from getting it done? No, but I, I think that the difficult part here is that um, the use cases that needs the different types of access technologies have to be there. And, and we are not the ones driving these use cases. The use cases will be driven by the different uh, uh, IoT providers or application providers. So, so they might see that, okay, this, this use case, because we have uh, examples of use cases where they're using narrowband IoT as the only access technology. Correct. And, and we ask them, what about firmware updates? That's going to take uh, three weeks with the, um, with the bandwidth you have on this. But apparently that's the, not all of these uh, issues are being really considered. Uh, and and uh, I think that the investments that are done so far, uh, of course, have to be recovered. But it's going very slowly on, on, on the narrowband IoT. Uh, yeah, one is that the operators couldn't charge a narrowband IoT because they didn't have a charging principle, which, which has been sorted now. They can start charging. And second, you're right, they don't see traffic moving. There's hardly anything happening there. But there are a lot of use cases on this. I mean, there are enough use cases about IoT being uh, what IoT is used for, whether it's going to be for video, you know, video telephony, or whether it's going to be for uh, electric panels being charged or metering. There are a lot of use cases. So I think this more about education, or how do we break the conundrum of operators thinking of it as a value proposition and doing something about it? rather than putting roadblocks in that conversation and saying, this is not going to happen, I'm going to charge you a cent or cent there. I'm trying to figure out, is there a solution for it or no? I, I don't think there's sort of a straightforward approach to this. I think that events like this where we're discussing these things is a way to bring this discussion forward and hopefully some understanding uh, between both operators but also the IoT customers. And, and uh, I, I think that, yes, we made the investments, but we have also been very good at, at uh, describing this from a technical perspective. And I think still we, we need to be a little bit more uh, clear on, on the advantages of this technology or that technology. And, uh, and another challenge I see is that we have narrowband IoT and we have LCM with a lot of features. Basically, it's uh, power uh, saving okay. mode and, and extended coverage, that of the two. But there are much more. And, and I'm not sure that we fully understand the, the capabilities when it comes to these different features linked to uh, what kind of IoT applications that, that we can see our customers having. But again, I mean, I see a huge growth in different types of applications. So, so I, I think it, it will evolve. But you can argue whether it's fast enough. And, the, and the return of investment is probably quite long, yeah? yeah thank you. And how many of the, those use cases are waiting for 5GSA? Well, I haven't seen that many real use cases. Um, we have this about uh, self-driving cars or gaming and things. And, and there are actually other solutions for that. Yeah. Uh, for gaming, I mean, uh, a local eSIM solution is the easiest one to get very low uh, latency on your uh, gaming device. And for uh, self-driving cars, uh, I think we have to have 100% coverage before we can go down to 25 milliseconds delay. It's not about uh, roaming or not roaming. It's about is there coverage that has holes that are smaller than what a car moves in 25 milliseconds. Right. Thank you. Any more, Matthew? Uh, um, Hi. Oh, yeah. Um, on this topic, I think it's really interesting. And uh, I have to say that the cross, as I call it, cross fertilization here on different types of products or services, you know, different solutions, I think it's perfect. It's what the industry needs. I guess my comment is in relation to we're talking a lot about IoT and all of the different use cases. And it is unbelievably interesting, all of the types of use cases. Um, especially as you kind of move into a 5G world. My comment slash question relates to if there's a still a disconnect between the retail offerings of IoT, which are massively growing, have huge potential, 
um, all of the different use cases as we've just mentioned. And what happens on the wholesale side, taken right back on the negotiations for the wholesale agreements that at the end of the day need to support these. Is there a disconnect? Is there a knowledge disconnect there, an understanding disconnect, a commercial disconnect, whatever it might be, to say that perhaps what's happening on the traditional, I'll, I'll call it, wholesale roaming discount negotiations is either not keeping pace with or not fully supporting the unbelievably fast growth and pace, not just of the service, but the different types of services and what they need. Uh, and is that gap growing? Is it shortening? Maybe it comes back also to, I think, a question that Stuart potentially asked there. I don't know if it re relates to that as well. But is there a gap there? And, is, and if so, how can we plug that gap? You know, should it be potentially simpler on the wholesale roaming and let the creativity, the innovation, the real sexy part be on the retail side? Yeah, and, and I'm... Definitely also saying to my colleagues that are doing the negotiations, don't be creative, be smart. Uh, and, and we are having these discussions internally. And, and we are trying to have these discussions also with roaming partners that, as I probably also said a couple of times uh, in the different presentations, it's possible to generate the same revenue on a simple model than on a complex model. But you will save a lot of time when you have to do the settlement. So, so there is, I think there is a gap, but maybe it's also a little bit about this uh, fuss about monetizing IoT. That uh, monetization is driven by complex model, but, but it doesn't have to be like that. And we should simplify so that the more, let's say, advanced uh, things are happening on support of the retail business and, and not necessarily in, in the wheeling and the dealing on the wholesale. Uh, so so uh, we are very much trying to uh, promote simplicity also in the discounts models, not meaning that it, it takes away the, the revenue from, from the visited network. It just makes it the cost predictable. So, so there's still a lot of learning. So one last question over here, please. Uh, hello. Uh, a question to Hirab al Shaib. Um, my question is, what are, what, do, um, how can I say this? What do you wish you knew before uh, you start uh, <laughs> developing these uh, machine learning models to this case? And why this case? I also, I also ask you if you try to another use cases, and if yes, why did you not, did you not pursue those cases, and why this one? Thank you. So, uh, first of all, what I presented today about the fraud management is where actually Latro started. So, we started as a company on the fraud management. So, a lesson learned is that you start with the things that you know, and you start with the things that you understand in order actually to get use of the technology. So, don't jump into something that you don't know, relying that the technology will give you the knowledge that you need in order to make it work. So, this is why we started at Latro with the fraud management, which is our bread and butter. Now, we started with that, and we saw the results because we knew what, what needs to be done. We knew the basics. And if you look at my last slide, where actually it is like a pyramid. Though, and then the IML is just the crown jewel. It's the, on the top of it. It's not on the bottom of it. Okay. So make sure that you understand all the layers. Then you apply a IML on top of that. But actually, the last two slides that I didn't show yeah. was actually uh, related to the expansion that you can make. So once you master that and you understand how you can go, you can grow horizontally and vertically into other domains. We did a churn prediction for a mobile money operator and we got some really good results because now we understand what happens. Now we understand the data. Now we understand how to tackle it. Now we understand the business that we are in. So what we did, and I hope that you do, is that before you jump into any technology, you should know the basics and you should understand exactly what you're looking for. Then find the technology that will help you to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you. And just one, sorry, I lied. There was one last question I wanted to ask you. In this year where generative AI is 
everywhere is the biggest hot topic. What, what, ex what feeling do you have about it? I mean, what, what ex are people asking more about AI-related services? Is it something that you're exploring, you feel like you should be exploring more, or how, how is your feeling? I'll, I'll relate to one point that was mentioned during our conversations here, is that sometimes this industry is driven by vendors. So if you look at the buzzwords that are being created, most of them are actually coming from the vendor side. I'm, I'm a vendor, and I'm, maybe I shouldn't say that, but this is actually the reality. And if you start hearing this word, then someone else, and another vendor needs to put that in his presentation because he will look suddenly like from the Stone Age if he doesn't do it. So that's number one, and it's a fact. So to take that and to put it in realization is what we are trying to achieve here. Just set the expectation. And from a user perspective, from an MNO perspective, you need to understand the limitations so that you can actually pick the technology once you have the use case for it. It is very promising. And I really encourage everyone to look into it. There are huge potential out of the AI ML. And we are actually pursuing that actively. We're doing partnerships, we're testing tools, we're doing use cases, because it is actually going to the future. But make sure that you understand not the technology, but what the technology will do for you. And this yeah. is actually the question that we need to, to ask first. Excellent. Thank you so much.